What is it that you are doing to avoid becoming arrogant? Your current situation is very inviting for that. Yeah, well, I would say a good dose of existential terror or cure you that. You know, there's a there's a saying in the Old Testament that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And like, first of all, and, and there's some real truth in that, you know, like I don't want to make a mistake. And so I live in constant terror that I'm going to utter some damning phrase that's going to sink everything I've done. And so I'll tell you, if you feel that way about the situation, then you, the probability that you're going to be arrogant is pretty damn low. And like, I don't feel I have any reason to be arrogant, you know, like, Here's, here's something you could do if you're really interested in this, but it's really hard. There's a paper by Carl Jung called The Relations Between the Ego and the Unconscious. And it's an unbelievably brilliant paper. It's very difficult to understand, but it has to do with what Jung called ego inflation. And so imagine that as you move up a hierarchy of authority or competence, we're not going to call them dominance or power hierarchies because I don't think that's reasonable. But as you move up, you know, you're, you have the you have the temptation of having your ego inflate to match your hypothetical position of status. But what that is, is in some sense, the taking on of the archetype as if it's a personal triumph or a personal construct or a per personal invention. And Jung warned very, very strongly against that. And he knew what he was talking about because of course Jung had his followers and was an extraordinarily powerful man from a spiritual and a physical perspective. He was certainly no pushover and a very brave person. And he had the temptation of becoming, well, a cult leader, for example, which people have accused him of being and which he certainly wasn't. And he knew that, you know, if you, if you have the privilege of rising in a, in a hierarchy, what that means if the rising is real is that the archetype is operating through you and that you can't take credit for that. You have to, you have to separate your personality in some sense from the archetype. I can give you a funny example of that. It's like, and, and I hope that nobody takes this wrong, but it, it's very comical. You know how all the superheroes have a alter ego? So you can't be Superman unless you're also Clark Kent and you can't be, well, Batman isn't such a good example because he gets to be a playboy billionaire like Iron Man, but Superman's a better example. You know, he's this mild mannered and meek reporter. And without that, he can't be Superman. It's like, well, that's the reason that's such a well-established comic trope is because comics are deeply mythological and there's the idea there that uh, the, the person has these two elements and one is the archetypal and and it's associated with the infinite it's like the god in man you could say that um, there's a great icon by the way of christ as pantocrator one of the very earliest icons that show him with two different facial halves the eyes are different and and the face is asymmetrical and one one face is the face of god half face is the half face of god and the other is the half face of man and he's holding a book it's i'm having jonathan pagio who's a brilliant carver i'm having him carve me that image so that i can put it in my front porch because i love it and christ is holding a book and so you know it's it's such a beautiful image this idea of man as a duality between the finite and the infinite and and simultaneously holding forth this you know wealth of knowledge that's been gathered by the human race it's it's mind mind expanding visual imagery anyways i mean back to the arrogance issue is that you know i'm i'm so i'm so what would you say attuned to the fact that i'm barely staying on that line between chaos and order and that any foolishness on my part or any attempt to manipulate the situation for my own let's say selfish personal gain you know that sort of impulsive um and and shallow and immature and 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 short-sighted personal gain that 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 willingness or wish to lord it over other people or to feel in some sense superior man if i go there with the exposure that i've got right now i'd be sunk so fast that it wouldn't even be funny and that would not be pretty and i would not want that so i'm i'm doing my best man to keep myself on the ground and where's where I want to be and I've got my family to help me with that and I've got my friends who are offering me you know corrective criticism on an ongoing basis and I listen to the negative comments on e on YouTube and I try to pay attention to them and evaluate them and not just dismiss them out of hand you know if they're crude or crass or any of those things then I'm less likely to pay attention to them but you know even when I'm called far right I pay attention to that you know because well 
you got to listen to your enemy. That's the thing. That's another New Testament injunction. You should listen to your enemy because your enemy will tell you things about yourself that no one else will tell you. Now, some of those things might not be true, but some of them might be. And if your enemy tells you something terrible about yourself that's true, then he's immediately become your best friend because you bloody well want to know if there's something terrible about you so that you can get it rectified before it ruins your life and ruins your family's life and, you know, detrimentally affects the course of the world and all of that. So...